Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, postdoc discussion. Uh, today is uh, preparing for the academic job market, how to prepare the application for an academic faculty position uh, brought to us by um, Dr. Ellen Bass. Um, we've got a, a, a lot to get through, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to her. Ellen, take it away. Thank you. And I want to uh, thank Darren uh, amongst the many hats that he has at Drexel. One of them is helping the College of Nursing and Health Professions with our postdoc program. And uh, the postdoc, CNHP allowed me to open up the participation for this particular seminar series, not only to uh, PhD students and postdocs at Drexel, but also for the broader community. And I was told that we have about 70 people who are interested in this topic. So I, th I think we made a good choice. <laughs> um, I would like to just give you a, a second about my background, uh, both to let you know what my perspective is, as well as to let you know what my perspective is not. So I, I, I've been an academic and I've been a, a professor since 2002. I've worked at two different universities. So clearly I, I've applied for academic positions. I've served on search committees, which we're gonna talk about. I've chaired search committees. I've been a department head where I was responsible for doing the negotiations with the hire, I'm now a senior associate dean for research. So I now look at our applications from a research perspective. So I'm bringing that uh, lens as I make this presentation. Let me tell you the lens that I'm not bringing to this presentation. So my background is in engineering. And so most of my experiences have been with engineering, and though I'm jointly appointed in the College of Nursing and Health Professions and College of Computing and Informatics at Drexel, I really haven't uh, had the opportunity to do any mentoring of clinical faculty. So those of you who are thinking about clinical positions, there's, there will be a lot of nuggets of information that are generalizable and will help you, but you will need of course, to get that additional feedback and training from others. When thinking about this particular topic, the preparing for the academic job market, I decided to break this up into three different discussions, and I'll make that clear in a minute while I did why I did that. Um, when I initially set up the series, I uh, had not reached out to Professor Amy Throckmorton. She's a professor here at Drexel in biomedical engineering who has led seminars on how to negotiate an academic faculty position. And she has agreed to join us for the third topic and I can't be more delighted. So I'd like to give you both an insight into the broader issue of the faculty search and to make clear to you why these three particular seminars are important. So when we think about the faculty search process, what you see in yellow are the parts that you see. You write your application and submit it, if you pass the filter and if the university uses a telephone interview process, you will be part of a telephone interview. There'll be a down select and some of those people will be invited to a campus interview. You will be part of that. And then there will be the negotiation of your offer. Now with COVID, this may be different but this is typically how it works. The, the campus interview perhaps this, in this upcoming year might be virtual. Um, the other piece I will say is that um, there may be a difference in not only how the search process is run in this uh, COVID era. 
I have no idea whether or not there'll be as many positions open. So this, this is a, a quite an unusual year. But the information I'm about to provide to you and discuss should be generalizable both in the pre and post COVID era. So let, let's step back. How does a position even arise? So there has to be some advocacy for the position. A position may arise because a faculty member in a department retired or moved to another institution. But there was some analysis done of department need. And the department negotiated with the dean, the provost, perhaps even higher, in order to have a position. Once that position is allowed, and, and perhaps this may, may happen in spring, then there needs to be a search committee formed. There's always a chair of that search committee. The search committee usually has several faculty from the home department and also members outside the home department. And there's a lot of thought about balance along a lot of different issues to make sure that the search committee is balanced. The search committee members are trained through human resources, not to say that everyone's an expert, but university best practices are to make sure that the search committee understands their roles. The first issue that the search committee needs to deal with is to the development of the position announcement. We're gonna talk about the position announcement, but suffice it to say, it's a human process for, for what ends up on that position announcement. Once the position announcement is made, it's sitting probably on a, a jobs or human resources website and the faculty has to make sure that people know that this position is available. We're gonna talk about that a little bit today. Once that happens, then people like yourselves can actually write applications and submit them. A lot of applications come in for a particular announcement. Some of them are completely unrelated. You would be surprised. Perhaps the position uh, is in a department that's requiring expertise in engineering and someone applies and their expertise is in history. You know, that's a clear uh, lack of a qualification. But there's other things. For example, the person might need to have a PhD and you know that you can apply for a position when you're still a student. And so this notion of you know, doing those filters uh, is not a perfect process. Imagine that you've gotten 300 job applications and you're gonna go telephone interview 10. So I'm gonna to talk to you about how to get into that 10. The telephone interview is gonna be a topic of another seminar, what questions to prepare for, things of that nature. But that group will be down selected. Usually that's when references are asked for. Usually the applicant is not part of the reference asking process. We'll talk about that in a minute or actually in several minutes. And then there's a campus interview, which will be part of another topic. Once a person is selected to be the applicant, then there needs to be an, an offer made to that person. This is a very confusing time for you as the applicant. Um, we'll talk about this in a future seminar, but suffice it to say, you may come for your campus interview. You may be one of three or four. An offer may not be made until the last person interviews. You may be thinking, wow, no one's getting back to me. Maybe I didn't get the position. No, if you're the last person, you know, it's, you might get the offer sooner. 
sometimes applicants are applying for more than one job and so things get moved in to adapt to the applicants. But in general, uh, it's a linear process where there's a set of interviews and then the candidates are ranked and then the offers are, are administered. So giving you that big picture, let's, let's, di let's go and dive in to the parts that really are about you and what you need to do. I know this sounds really obvious, but just knowing that these position announcements exist can be troublesome for many applicants. So how do you know? that applications are can be um, submitted. Chronicle of Higher Education has a really good search engine. Many universities put their job announcements there. Listservs are a very good way to get job announcements. I tell a lot of my PhD students to join professional societies when they're ready get on the job market. And also I tell my postdocs the same thing. Sometimes it's the best money you ever spent, if only to get information about job announcements. Networking is really important. A lot of us put things up on LinkedIn. Um, it's a good way to, to find things, but also networking through professional organizations, faculty and things of that nature. If there's a particular institution that you have your eye on, there's no reason why you couldn't reach out to faculty to let them let you know if something's coming. And conferences typically are a good way to do networking, a little bit more complicated in this COVID era. Oh, I should point out that I have links on a lot of these slides where I took some of this information or where I think there's additional information that you might find useful. Higher ed jobs should be your new best friend if you don't know this exists. Uh, they have a, a really nice search engine you, of course, have to be careful that you look and see that you're pulling the right job ads. Um, they both have it by one website where they just have it by area, and then they have this advanced search, which makes it easy to you know, pull different searches. Let's talk about the ad. Usually the ad is from a department and is looking for a particular kind of faculty. It could be tenured or tenure track. If it's a, a tenure track position, they'll use the term tenure track, which means they're looking for an assistant professor. They might say all ranks or open rank, which means it could be assistant associate or full. They might be looking for teaching faculty. They could be looking for clinical faculty. They could be looking for adjuncts uh, or lecturers. So you really wanna make sure that you check the rank. The other issue is to look for the discipline. So I just picked ones that were relevant to me, you know, health systems or human factors or data science. So that'll give you some hints in what they're looking for with respect to areas. You may do this search and you may find a lot of positions. Hopefully you will. 20, 50 positions. Think about how many interviews you, you would really want. So I've heard faculty, oh, there's some questions in the chat. Um, I hope I hit your, your question, Tiffany. Um, 
I don't cold email deans in my field. I email, I don't start with the dean. I start with the, the people who are in the same area as me at that, at that institution. So if, if I were looking for a position at another institution, I might email someone who is in human factors and in, so I'm, I'm an active member of human factors and, in, uh, and HFES, human factors and ergonomic society. I might look for a human factors person at that institution and reach out to them. Let me tell you why. First of all, if I'm going to go to an institution and they already have people in my field, they're going to be my new colleagues. So I already want to start schmoozing them. <laughs> and then second of all, I mean, the dean may not actually know a lot about that particular position because you're going to be a member of that department. And so if that dean has a lot of departments, the, the D might not actually be the best person to get your information from. I will, and I'll get to this in a minute, but if you're targeting a particular institution and you don't know anybody there, use your network to help you find somebody to target. Because also, for example, uh, there may be people that people know who are good people to contact at the institution and might be more helpful. But so use your network to find, to ask people who to contact at that institution. All right, so as I mentioned, there's gonna be a lot of applications coming in and the search committee is gonna screen out a lot of them. Dr. Best, there was one more question in the chat above that one. Oh, one what was it? Uh, it's, uh, I've always been told that the vast majority of tenure track positions aren't posted, uh, that it's all word of mouth, who you know. Can you speak to this? Also came from Tiffany. Well, I, I don't think so, not anymore. I, but I will say, I have seen a lot of announcements on LinkedIn where faculty at a particular institution put it on their LinkedIn or the department puts it on LinkedIn. So if that's considered word of mouth, that can happen. These ads are cheap. I mean, these ads can be expensive. And me posting something on LinkedIn is free. So it really depends on the budget. But I do see a big use of social media, and I see a lot of use of listservs of professional societies. So if that's word of mouth, then yes, that would be a, a, a way in which people disseminate that information. The reason I mentioned that a lot of things get screened out is if you're trying to apply to 50 places, you're probably not putting your best foot forward in all those cover letters, which we'll talk to in a bit. So think about your target. And I'm gonna show you the hints of about how to really target that ad. Um, let me suggest though, that you target places where you think you're well positioned and also do some reach places. You might say, oh, I'm not good enough for that place. Bah, get that thought out of your head. If you have a PhD from a good university, you can apply anywhere. However, you might get um, the opportunity to you may be in a position where you don't have the CPU cycle, so to speak, or you don't have the energy to write really good applications. And that's where I'm saying you want to target positions only because of your own time. You're going to see ads and they're going to use a lot of language like what's required or what's preferred or what's nice to have. And this is where you're seeing the human process come in. I can imagine in my mind's eye that that search committee was writing that ad and they were having a lengthy conversation about this topic and they settled on some language. And what is required and what's preferred was an outcome of that conversation. Read the required material read the preferred material because it might give you some hints about what they're looking for. Also, think about qualified. So if it says, you know, person must have teaching experience and you're thinking to yourself, well, I've never been the instructor record of a course. 
and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, qualified is in the eye of the beholder. So for example, if you're a PhD student and you haven't finished your uh, degree yet, technically you're not qualified because you don't have a PhD, but by the time you, know, you actually get to be hired, you will. I will tell you something. I accepted a job offer for an academic position before my PhD was completed. Accepted. I was supposed to show up in the fall. I did not have my PhD. I will tell you that there was nobody who did not want me to go to that institution and they shifted my start date to January. So technically I was completely unqualified even to get the offer. And I didn't even make my start date, but it didn't matter. They just, they just shifted my start date. I've also heard cases of people starting as a untenured position until they shift, got their PhD and shifted to the tenure position. So like I said, qualified in the eye of the beholder. This is a job ad that I took from the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, ad that was on higher ed. I, actually, I saw there's some Wisconsin-Madison folks uh, participating today. I picked this one because as you can see, it's showing you their, their little hints, their little tells of what they're looking for. They wanna complement their existing program. They have specific interests. So that should tell you maybe that's on the required side. But they want to cast a wide net. If there's someone great that's kind of on the edge or periphery, they don't want to lose that person. So they use include but are not limited to. You know, they use that phrase but are not limited to a lot. That's telling you we want to cast a wide net. They have terms like should. That seems required. But then they use words like potential for, which is, well, maybe the person isn't doing that now, but we want to think they might be able to do that in the future. So as you're reading the ads, you're going to see these, these words that give you hints about what's required and what's preferred. So it's giving you hints about what you want to highlight. Let me tell you a couple other things you're going to find in the ad. This is again from that same ad. You're going to see a deadline. If they've gotten a lot of applications, it's a hard deadline. If they haven't gotten a lot of applications, it's not a hard deadline. So if you happen to notice an ad and the date passed, contact the contact. So here's a, the faculty search committee chair, right on the, you know, say, tell them, I know, you know, I noticed your call closed on July 15th. Uh, is it still possible to apply? The answer might be yes. So human process. That would be a good reason why you want to contact the, the faculty search committee chair because you missed the deadline and you want to try to squeeze in. Sometimes there's a hard close on the HR system, but they'll still take your ad. Why? It's a human process. So maybe the committee hasn't started deliberating yet and they don't want to lose a good applicant. Who knows? So just take a look. All right, what goes into the application? Everyone is different. All of them have a CV and all of them have a cover letter. Most of them have an ask for references. Most of them have a teaching research and some have a diversity statement. Sometimes they're three different statements. Sometimes they're all in one. Sometimes they don't have the inclusion statement. So let me talk to you about those. And that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of the time on. And then I'll open it up. 
Oh, let me tell you something really important. If there are 400 applications, we're going to screen 300 of those applications in about an hour or less. We're going to divvy them up and screen them out because we cannot do a deep dive on 400 applications. So it's really important that your CV has a quick and easy scan to make us want to look at it. And then once we get into the deeper dive, we're going to look at all that other material. So let me tell you a little bit about how to do that. Have a research interests section on your CV. If I look at that, and by the way, these are from Matthew Bolton, my former PhD student who got tenure at Buffalo. So it, I just happened to use his as an example. If you don't have a research interest section right, right on your CV, it's hard for me to see if, if you meet those criteria. And by the way, you may want to tweak your CV with the research interest for each of the applications you give just to get past that filter. We want to see that you have a PhD in the area that we're interested in. So make sure that that's really prominent and make sure that all of your information, the rest of your information is neat and tidy. If you want us to know details about things you did, put it on your CV. So I include here as an example when Matthew was a research assistant for the Center for Applied Biomechanics. He put a few bullets on his CV to let people know what he did. That way he doesn't have to make his other statements very lengthy, but still gets that information in there for the deep dive. And that's where you can leverage the appointment section of your CV. On your CV, we are trying to understand if you are going to be successful as an academic. We want to know if you're going to be able to create and present high quality work, whether you're going to be able to get external funding, and if you need artifacts or, you know, if you're writing patents or writing software, if you're able to do that. What's on your CV are lagging indicators, your past performance. We're not really interested in your past performance. We're interested in your projected future performance. So we're looking to see a lot of your latest details. This is where you want to make sure that manuscript under review to that high quality journal is there. If you really have a manuscript that you're about to submit, you can have manuscripts in preparation. If I see a CV with 100 manuscripts in, in preparation, it tells me right away that that is not a person I want to bring to the next level because they're not really being serious about what they're going to do next. However, if you just defended idiosyncratically, like let's say Rachel, let's say you defended last Friday and you just turned in all your stuff recently and you really do have a manuscript that you're writing right now, yes, put that manuscript in preparation. But uh, be very judicious about that. And the reason is it's, it's still a lagging indicator. It's stuff that you did before you came. However, we do want to see your research outputs and they need to be organized and neat. For your publications, separate them by category. Get those manuscripts that are under review in a separate section than with the ones that you're, you've actually submitted, uh, I'm sorry, that you actually have accepted or impressed or actually published. Separate out your talks and your presentations that don't have publications from your publications. If you have patents, separate those out. If you have software artifacts. If you have grants, 
separate those out. What we're looking for in our quick scan are high quality peer reviewed first author publications. So if I look at someone's CV and I'm thinking about hiring them for an academic position and they have zero first author high quality publication, they're not getting out of the pile of 400. It's not doing it. So it's really important. And the reason is that I'm only picking 10 for interviews. So probably I'm looking at 400. There's probably 50 of them that I'm going to bring back to the search to committee to discuss, maybe only 25. Then we're going to down select from there. Let's talk about teaching. Most people do not have a lot of teaching experience. We're looking for evidence that you're going to be able to teach and advise. And we want you to be able to address a diverse group of students. So think really broadly about your teaching. Maybe you help the, st the student group for the Society of Women Engineers and you were a mentor for them. Or maybe there was an undergraduate student in the lab that you mentored. So think really broadly about how you're gonna demonstrate your teaching and your advising potential especially if you haven't been an instructor of record. Maybe you were a grader, but you didn't have office hours. Maybe you had office hours, but you didn't give a lecture. Maybe you gave a guest lecture in a class, but you weren't the instructor of record. No indicator is too small. So um, include, try to include those. By the way, all of this information can be on your CV. Service. I will say for the record that nobody who is excellent in service but not excellent in teaching and research is going to make it out of the pile. So if I've got 400 and I'm going to move something forward and you were president of a student organization, that is not going to make up for the other two. However, even when you, and, and even when you're junior faculty, service is sometimes not as important as your t-shirt, your t-shirt, which is a combination of teaching and research, a word I just made up, teaching and research. However, it's really good for you meeting people. It's really good for the organization to have you involved in lots of things. And therefore, if you have none, it doesn't look good. We wonder, why isn't this person engaged? Um, it's also a great way to highlight your inclusion activities. Many times, a lot of your inclusion activities are through service and not through teaching and research. So it's a good way to highlight those. I don't expect applicants at an assistant professor level to be doing a lot of international or national service. Well, you might have some professional society leadership. You might be the newsletter editor of your uh, professional society subgroup. You might be, you might have been the session chair. You might, um, you know, you, as I say, you might be doing things at the university. You might also have been doing a lot of reviewing for conferences and things of that nature. I have this thing called other because don't forget to include the other things that you do, like media coverage. Perhaps you were uh, in the school newspaper for something, you know, so have a section for your media coverage and for the other parts. All right. The research statement, super critical, super critical. And my advice to you is imagine it's a year after you've been at that institution. What would you like to have done in that year? That needs to be in your research statement. We don't, we don't want to have a recapitulation of your whole dissertation. We want you to place your work in a broader context, identify two or three themes of your research, perhaps put in a little bit of findings of yours, that's where you could talk about your manuscripts in preparation. 
but we're really very interested in what you're planning to do. What is your future? What are you, what proposals do you think you're going to write? What research collaborations are you going to establish? So if you're writing a, a two page research statement and there's only one paragraph about your future, you kind of miss the mark. When you talk about your future plans and I'm telling you, you need to, you should be specific. So if you're in my field, human factors, for example, you could talk about writing a National Science Foundation CRII proposal and what the topic of it might be. And it could be an extension of your dissertation work, but that will tell me two things. It'll tell me one, you're actually thinking about what you're gonna do in that first year when you come. And two, you've done your homework and you've really found a real, uh, a real proposal mechanism that you can apply for. Let me also tell you that a lot of agencies have summer programs and other programs to get people started. So for example, ONR has a faculty program where in the summer you can go and they bas you basically tour around different labs in ONR and they work with you to hook you up with potential research sponsors. If a junior faculty applicant talks about that they might want to apply to that program, they've already been reading about it, and they think their work might have some relevance to that agency, that tells me they're thinking about you know, how they're going to develop their research program. I know the postdocs at Drexel have been talking about K awards um, and things of that nature. So, um, oh good. So someone's actually um, had that experience. Um, so that's, uh, that's really good. Oh, I missed, uh, I missed Joey's um, comment about the authorship order. So, if a student is the last author because they're in a medical journal, I understand that. Um, it would be unusual. It would be unusual for a person to graduate with a PhD and not have a first author publication. I, and I'm just telling you, even if the last author position is really critical in healthcare as an example. My postdoc is the first author and I'm the last author. Or my PhD student will be the first author and I will be the last author. So if for some reason somebody has all last author publications because they thought that was the position of honor, they should make that clear in their, in their statements. But first authorship to me shows you're the one who was the, the leader mm -hmm. of, of that particular uh, paper. There, uh, Dr. Bass, there's one more question above that. Um, which is more important to a research committee when considering publications, quality or quantity? It concerns me if a person was in a PhD program for three or four years and only has one paper. But there are so many different ways in which you can um, publish. I've seen disciplines where people put in high quality, high rejection rate conference proceeding papers like Takai, and they have all uh, conference proceedings papers. In engineering, the person might have one high quality journal publication because they do human factors work. And by the time they got the IRB, ran their subjects, ran through the review process, you know, two and a half years have gone by. So I don't really hit people too hard on quantity, but if I don't see that one paper, it really worries me because it tells me that that person hasn't been through the cycle. 
Um, also, I do look at the quality of the venue. So for example, in my field, we have a healthcare conference in our Human Factors and Ergonomics Society that papers get reviewed on the abstract. And when a person submits a full paper, it's after the conference and isn't even peer reviewed. So if someone has a hundred of those, I'm like, yeah, they're first author, but those weren't even peer reviewed. But if they have one peer reviewed first author paper in the journal Human Factors, I'm like, wow, okay, that was rigorously reviewed. Good for them. So someone could have a hundred healthcare symposium, honestly, would weight that zero, except I know that they're good at presenting, which is nice for teaching. One high quality journal article, they get all the you know kudos for that. So I would say quality is important and be, you know, make sure that you're getting those high quality papers. In computer science, they do a, they publish a lot of their papers in high rejection rate conferences. I would value that the same as a, a high quality journal article. So it really depends on the venue and the um, discipline. As I mentioned, very few people have actually been instructor of records for courses, but that doesn't mean that you can't um, write a really excellent teaching statement. And the teaching statement should be tailored to the place you're applying. You've taken a lot of classes, so you know a lot about course content, and you've had some terrible classes. So you know a lot about good and bad uh, teaching and pedagogy. Do yourself a favor. Look at the courses for the programs that you're applying for. Look at them, talk about them. That will show your interest in pedagogy and teaching as much as your discussions about your own background. Think about what you have taken in your program and would some of that benefit that program? So I tell students and, and postdocs who are looking for positions, review the course catalog and then think about what courses you would wanna teach. Put that in your teaching statement. I'm In your program at Drexel, you have a brand new Masters in Human Centered Computing and there's a master's of information science with, with a um, specialization in human centered computing. I'm, I would be prepared to teach these courses. By the way, there might be people on the search committee who's that's their favorite courses. So try to throw some other ones in there so they don't think you're get, they're gonna lose all their courses. But you can, you know, you could really have a nice discussion about what you wanna teach and what you could teach. And you could also make some suggestions about things that you learned in your coursework that you think are missing from their curriculum and would be useful. Another place to put in your inclusivity work because you could talk about your mentoring and some other work that you've done and you could also talk about things that you would do in the classroom to make the environment more welcoming. I mentioned that some universities are now asking for an inclusion statement. They do not have to be very long, but they do have to be. Get yourself educated on the, on the terminology. Think really hard about how much of your own um, background you're willing to put into an inclusion statement. It is not required. Some people do, some people don't. I am an LGBT person. I talk a lot about LGBT in my inclusion statement if I were going to write one, but I'm not telling people that they should come out in their, in their statement. I will tell you though, I do it because if it's a barrier, I probably don't wanna go work there anyway, but I don't tell people what they should or shouldn't do. But, but if I'm gonna talk about work that I did for inclusion and I wanna talk about my own experience, I must, I must talk authentically about myself and what I do. Um, 
and it's then very easy for me to be able to talk about future plans and things I might like to do. Let me just spend a second on references. Think about who's going to write your references. Clearly, your dissertation advisor, your postdoc advisor. Some ads ask for three, some ads ask for five. So I tell students and post, postdocs to think about identifying five people, but line up three ahead of time. When you actually are starting to apply, let them know. <laughs> you would be surprised how many times I've been contacted, not usually by people applying for uh, applications for uh, assistant professor jobs, but by students who, who, you know, put me on a job reference and I didn't even know. And then I get contacted and I then I have to go contact the student. I didn't even know that they were putting me down as a reference. Um, and this, again, this happens mostly more with undergrads, but just let your references know. Give them your materials so they know what you said. So if they're being asked to write a letter, they can embellish upon things that you've told them or highlight some things that you didn't have space to put. Give them the final drafts. And then give them status. We are happy to help you as a reference. And the last thing we want to do is to ask you whether you got the job, but we really want to know. Did you get the job? So, you know, it's this little balance of us wanting to be helpful, but not making you feel bad if you didn't make the cut. So just keep us informed. The cover letter. This is the last thing I'm gonna cover. Little joke there. Number one, it's a letter. Dear search committee, dear search committee chair, professor so-and-so, it's dated. It's a letter. You sign it. Tailor it to the position. Make clear the reader knows that you want to be in that department. If it's the only thing you're allowed to submit, you got to put the research, teaching, and diversity information in there. But if you're having the opportunity to submit those other things, the cover letter can be short and sweet. As my research statement will show you, I'm well positioned to start a research program in human factors engineering. You will see that I've already helped my PhD advisor write proposals and I've already thought about how I will initiate my lab, right? I mean, you don't have to write the whole research statement again, but you can put some tidbits in there to help with that 400 person quick scan. I would say write the cover letter like you're already there. So let me give you a few hints and this will be my last slide. Dear so-and-so, I respectfully submit my application for the position in the Department of Umpty Squat for the tenure track position in blah, 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 blah. The position called describes, you're looking for this. I, you will see that my education, my academic experience, my professional experience, my industry experience, my civic service, you know, maybe you're active in your community, you know, has prepared me. I'm interested in joining the faculty because, and you might talk a little bit about a couple degree programs they have that you know you can contribute to, then they know you really want to be there. I could have immediate impact, you know, because I see that you've launched this new program and such and such, and I am ready to. And then mention, if there's people you know at the institution, you, I'm interested in coming to Drexel because you already have Ellen Bass and you know Professor Ellen Bass and Professor Michelle Rogers and Professor Andrea Forte and Alexander Sart and blah, blah. And I would like to join the Human Center Computing Groups because I have an expertise in this area which is synergistic with theirs. If I see a cover letter like that, that really tells me why that person wants to come. So I'm going to stop there and leave some time for questions. Um, but I hope I've helped demystify, you know, some of the search process and helped you think about the application process and uh, tickled your interest for the other two seminars. 
Um, I will tell you on the next seminar, we, I will talk to you about the kinds of questions you get asked on the telephone interview and we'll walk you through the campus interview process and how to prepare for it uh, so that uh, should you get start getting the telephone interviews and the campus interviews, you will, you will be prepared. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Bass? You can either enter it in the chat or you can turn your microphone on to ask your question. You covered a lot of ground, Ellen. Good yeah, job. Yeah, I think I put people to sleep, maybe. <laughs> oh, here comes a couple. Uh, a, a comment, uh, I came in late, but that was awesome. Uh, <laughs> will this presentation be available after this seminar? Um, what we typically do with our postdoc discussions is after we edit out the uh, sort of beginning and ending stuff to so just focus on the meat of the presentation, we upload it to the CNHP um, uh, postdoc discussion channel. Um, so this will be available there. What about for people outside of CNHP or outside of Drexel? It's uh, on YouTube. It's open to anyone who wants to get at it. Oh, good. Yeah, so it's on the, it's, I, can, I can share with you the direct link or the, the um, uh, playlist of the other presentations that we've done that have been open to the public. So there's a question, how, how does the search and selection process vary between the assistant and, okay. So at the assistant level, we are opening up the floodgate to get a lot of applicants what we want to do, to be honest, is we want to we want to try to recognize the diamond in the rough and bring that person to our institution. When we're looking for someone at the associate level, usually we're looking for someone who already has an established track record, and that person has a particular synergistic area that we want to bring to our institution. So for example, um, let's, just, let's just take a, an example. Let's say we had a human factors program and we had a lot of cognitive system engineering faculty and we had a strong biomechanics set of faculty. And then we had um, a biomechanics faculty member uh, retired or wanted to go to another program. And we were looking to bring somebody in with that particular expertise, but we also needed someone to um, reinvigorate our biomechanics program. And so we wanted someone who would do curriculum leadership. We might look for a particular skill set, and we wouldn't expect that a junior faculty would be able to come in and do a lot of that work because we wanna make sure that you get your research program started and things of that nature. So there may be some service expectation and there may be some um, very specific uh, teaching that we're looking for. This is pretty, pretty helpful. What about COVID? I do not have the crystal ball on COVID. I will tell you that the last I've heard about Drexel is there's, there's been a, a freeze on certain types of positions. I do not know if there are going to be freezes around the rest of the academic job market. I'm, I'll be honest, and I don't wanna be a Debbie Downer, but I am concerned about this year because, because of the uncertainty around the tuition. I will tell you that most institutions are tuition driven and because some of the uncertainty in COVID, some of the institutions are belt tightening. So I, I don't know what to tell you except that I don't have the crystal ball. I do have some concern. Um, in the broad topic calls, how closely do you look at the research interest there's a long list, it's just, just need connected to one. When they have the broad interest, what they're doing is casting a wide net and they're looking for the best person. 
So there are times where they say, you know what, we want to bring somebody in and we're going to bring in the best person, no matter what their research area is. And so I would say lead with your strength, let them know who you are. If the, and this is where you might want to get some inside information from people at the institution. So if I knew I was going to apply to a particular institution, I might reach out to a colleague there and try to get the skinny before I actually send my information in. And that's why I said earlier in the presentation, if you don't have such a person and you need an introduction, use your network to get the introduction so that you can get that information. Yes. Um, there are a lot of hiring freezes and I am really concerned about that. I would, for those of you who are postdocs, you know, there's maybe you can stay another year. For those of you who are PhD students, you know, you may think about whether you can stay another year as a PhD student, get all your papers out. You may think about postdocs. You know, the, I, I wish I had the crystal ball to tell you what, what to do in this COVID year, but it made me more interested in having this seminar series because of that. I think, I think all of the PhD students and the postdocs are going to need a lot of extra help in this COVID environment. Um, what would you think about someone who took time away from academia after completing their PhD or postdoc? Here's the deal. If you go and do clinical work and then want to apply for an academic position, make sure you're still publishing and make, you know, make sure you're, you're still in the game. What you don't want is that you're out of the game. Um, also, with respect to clinical, I would say talk to clinical faculty because I am not one. But if I saw a person who was a clinical faculty and in that clinical year, they put out a couple papers. And but mind you, you have a tail, right? The day you're at postdoc end, you probably haven't published everything. And if you have any strength left at the end of your crazy clinical shift to get some of that research out, that would look good because it meant you still had your, your foot in the door. But if a year or two went clinical and you didn't have any research output, you're gonna get outcompeted by the fresh new folks behind you. So just be mindful is that, that there's just a lot of competition. What are the biggest mistakes I see from applicants? I see a lot of mistakes. One is they did not tailor their cover letter to the job. You know, you can tell when somebody's written the same cover letter to a bunch of places because there's nothing in their cover letter that makes me say that they want to be in my position. So if you are applying to the College of Computing and Informatics, to the Department of Information Science, and your area is in human factors, and you, you didn't talk of anything about the fact that we have a master's in information science with a human-centered computing concentration, and you could teach there, I would say you don't know anything about our program. Why, why, why would I bother giving you a look, right? So, so take a look. Um, if your CV um, is really a mishmash, I would say, wow, I can't, I can't even read their CV. I've seen, I, I, I work a lot with people on their CVs, but I've seen people with their CVs, you know, they have that they were something from their high school chess teams still on there and they're, you know, applying for a postdoc position. Like, you know, get your, po get your CV clean and, and prepared. Because what does that tell me? It tells me this person's going to be a really heavy lift. So, you know, get it tight and clean. Um, I see mistakes where people list a lot of extraneous things and it gets lost in the meat. So if you have a lot of honors and awards and you're mixing in your best paper award with, let's say, an internal um, award that you got from, you know, a, uh, 
a, I'm going to use a real example. There was a student organization that gave you an award and you won the best journal article award from a particular journal. And there was a list of awards. And that best paper award was kind of mixed in with these other awards that were less prestigious and it didn't jump out. And you didn't highlight that somewhere else. I would say that's a mistake because you won a, a high quality peer reviewed journal paper of the year award and it was lost in the mess. So I tell you, give your materials to other people to look at and see what it says about you. Um, and, and make sure that the good stuff is really showing because when we have 400 applications to go through and I start looking at them at 930 at night and I got to look at my 200 or whatever and I'm scanning them, you know, that little bit of information might get lost. Do not write a five page research statement and a five page teaching statement because it's going to stuff's going to get lost, you know, really try to compact it and get it into the materials that we need. Outside of the number of postings, do I expect the hiring schedule to be the same? I think so. I just think I don't know what the on camp. I don't know what the campus interview is going to look like and whether that's going to be on zoom. We had some teaching faculty apply recently at Drexel and we did the interviews all on Zoom. Um, oh, another mistake I would say is to, um, not tell your references that you're applying for the positions. It takes a lot of time to write a good reference letter for somebody. And if I find out from the search committee that I owe a reference letter for you, and it's Friday, and it's due Monday, I am not going to have time to write you a good letter. But if I know now that you're applying, and I have all your materials, and I've been able to work with you on those materials, and I've worked with you to make the CV look good and I've helped you. you know, by the time I go to write your letter, I know exactly what I'm gonna write. So engaging, especially your advisor, whether it's your postdoc or, or your PhD advisor, early in the process, really important, not doing that, big mistake. If there's someone that you're gonna have write a letter, your PhD committee member, perhaps a subject matter expert that you worked with, perhaps a person who you were a teaching assistant for, but not your advisor. The per that person, definitely you have to give the heads up for because, you know, they may not, they may be caught unaware. I will tell you that helping you get a job is really important, but it's not the only thing we're doing and we need that lead time. Should references be from other universities? The reference should be someone who can let the search committee know about your research or your teaching or your commitment to inclusivity, right? It has to be someone who, who can, so your PhD advisor for sure, your postdoc advisor for sure. If you're someone else's TA for sure, um, if you're reaching out to somebody else, they better have something to talk about and you may tell them what you want them to talk about. Professor Bass, I would like you to be my reference because I took your class in such and such. And as you may recall, the project for your course, I ended up submitting as a conference paper and I want you to do my reference because I want you to speak to in my serious nature of my coursework and I'm like oh okay but if you just contact me and say I want you to be a reference I'm like well you're not you know you're not my student and I wasn't on your committee and I have no idea now I'm in a professional society 
someone in the professional society might say, I would like you to write me a letter because you and I were both officers in the cognitive decision, you know, cognitive engineering decision making. I would like you to talk to my commitment to my professional society. And by the way, here's some other stuff that I did that you might not know about. And if you can somehow win that in, that would be great. Oh, and by the way, here's a little text that you might, I couldn't fit it in. So, you know, I had to shorten my service section. So, you know, if you could put some of this stuff in there, then I, and I'm like, oh, thank you. And then in my letter, you may not know, but this person has also done these other things. So, you know, coaching your references, not a terrible idea. Um, should we list the references in the CV or say they could? I don't put my references on my CV. I usually want to, oh, let's see, when you apply for a job, you just list the references um, in, in a separate document. They might ask you what to do with them. Some people do put them on their CV and have all their contact information. I think it's personal preference. Um, I don't do it because if that person, God forbid something happens and they can't do it, now they're on my CV and now it might raise an eyebrow why the person I listed on my CV isn't where the references are coming from. So I'm super conservative and I don't put it on there. But, you know, I think it's personal preference. I think a message that should come out of this is that looking for a faculty position is a job of its own. You have to get your CV in place. You have to write all these statements. You have to review the job ads. You have to tailor your stuff for that university. You need to, after you start submitting, or you know, you, actually even before you submit, you gotta look at their course catalog. You gotta find people you might wanna collaborate there so that you can put it in your statement. So it's, an effortful process to do it right and it's time consuming and so you know it isn't too soon to start looking for the job announcements and you know getting these preliminary drafts of these things going and then working with your advisors to get these things polished i will tell you that people will be invited to the telephone interview because they have the right beans. And the right beans are, they're doing research in the right area, they have a PhD in the right area, they look like they can teach, and you know they have the right um, inclusivity stance for that place. Everything you're doing is the format of this, all that stuff is to give us that information. Have we telephoned interview people who had typos on their CV? Yes, we have. Have we telephoned interview people who had grammatical errors on their research statement? Yes, we have. Does it make my face cringe a little bit? Yes, it does. But, you know, English is not everybody's, you know, first language, you know, spell checker doesn't catch everything. So they don't have to be perfect, but you just want to get past that first filter. So, you know, putting your best foot forward is really good. But you can have all those beans. But if I can't find them, or they're hard to see, or they get lost in that late night view, you might get overlooked. And that's really the message that I want, wanted to come out of this talk is that you want to make it from the application received to the telephone interview. And what you've got is a lot of sleep deprived search committee members boring through a lot of documents trying to find those 10 or 25, let's just say they're trying to find those 25 that they want to bring to the search committee so that the search committee then can argue about their 25 so we can will it down to the 10. That's what you want to get through. And if you make it to the 10, hey, 
you've got a like one in 10 shot already of getting the, the um, position. A lot of people think, oh my goodness, I've got to put my best foot forward for the campus interview. Now you've got a one in four shot. What I'm telling you is that's great, but you want to get to the 10 and 400. And I think a lot of, a lot of people don't understand that, that, that there's a huge, a huge whittling filtering process going on and you want to get through that filtering process. And I will look at your CV. I will tell you, I will look at someone's CV. Those are, there are some people on this call who's I've reviewed their CVs. No, I'm gonna look, first author pub, where there's PhDs from, um, what, what it's in, um, do they have anything that looks like they might be able to teach? So have they given a conference presentation? You know, have they been in front of people? You know, we don't want slide people under, slide pizza under the door, good work comes out to be a faculty member. You gotta be in front of people. So you've presented at a conference, I know you could teach, right? So I'm looking for those nuggets. So help me see those nuggets. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Thank you very much, Dr. Bass. Thanks everybody for joining us today. If you have any questions, you can always send email to tuesdaytopics at drexel.edu and I'll relay the question to Dr. Bass if you don't have a direct contact. Yeah, or you know, you're always welcome to email me directly. Um, you know, do not be disappointed if it takes me a little bit of time to get back to you. I will tell you that uh, helping our our students and our postdocs find positions for me is a labor of love. I think it's very important, very important that we help people junior in the field get to the next step. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it's one thing that we do on top of a lot of other things we do. So if I don't get immediately back to you, it's, it doesn't mean I'm not going to get back to you. It just, you know, It'll be after I review the 200. Now it's midnight and now I'm gonna get back to you. So, uh, so I will get back to you because I think this is really important. The last thing I should say is use the other PhD students and postdocs and other people that you know to help you refine your material. Ask other faculty, not your PhD. You know, get as much help as you possibly can to get a good, clean, package and then you on your own can tailor the bits and pieces to the institutions you want to apply to but get the bones good get your cv good get a short and sweet research statement get a short and sweet teaching statement get a short and sweet inclusivity statement going now and then you can always tweak it for the applications that you apply and and do not underestimate how hard it is to write these things. It's your, if you haven't applied, it's like anything else. It's the first time you're writing it, so it's hard. But once you get the bones, you know, updating it and fixing it is a lot easier. All right, well, I wanna be respectful of everybody's time, including Darren's. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Apparently it's gonna be on YouTube. So, uh, you know, you'll have opportunity to see it again. Uh, I, I am happy to share my slides as well. Uh, so, um, Darren, what do I want to, how do I do that? Can that also be part of the? Yeah, folks can email me and I'll make sure they get them. Um, if you registered for the event and you were here, I, I took down your information. So I'll send it to everybody who showed up. Um, but if, if you didn't, if, you, if I couldn't make out your name from what was listed in the, in the participants link, uh, I might need some help. Getting to yeah, there's nothing, and by the way, there's nothing confidential in this information. I, I personally give everyone on this call permission to share these slides with whomever. I just want people to be successful because academia is not successful if you all are not successful. So, you know, feel free to share. Um, there's a lot of good links to other materials in here. And, you know, I just wish everybody good luck. Let people know about the other two seminars. I believe we're allowed to have, what, like 300 people on a Zoom? Yep. We only had, 
However, uh, I think our, our high water mark, we had 44 people here. So 42 guests plus you and me. Yeah, so, you know, there's room for, for additional folks. And uh, everybody have a, well, depending on your time zone, have a good evening. And um, I, I hope it's a very fruitful job search for everybody. And, and you know, keep in touch. <laughs>